Today's episode is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio. You'll be hearing more about them later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, John Tuhig, Managing Director and Head of Whole Loan Trading at Raymond James, and Nathan Stovall, Director of Financial Institutions Research for S&P Global Market Intelligence. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and nice to meet you, Nate. John, we are right here in the middle of bank earnings seasons. All of the large uh, banks, most of them have, have reported. And uh, today we're getting the first regional banks reported and a little bit of the volatility in the marketplace. A few banks missing, missing as well, missing their earnings expectations, I should say. John, going into this earnings season, based on what you're seeing on the ground as a tr- running a team of that is trading whole loans, not securities, but actual loans in between banks and, and financial institutions. What is your overall outlook on the banks? And I'm, I'm talking about you know, net interest margins, loan liquidity, interest rate risk, credit risk. What have you been seeing that that we are starting to see as now observers of, of the bank earnings? Well, Jack, thank you for having me back. Appreciate the uh, the opportunity to have the conversation again. Uh, lots of things to unpack on that very loaded question. Margins, compressing. Deposit costs rising, uh, loan growth slowing, uh, credit largely holding, uh, with some some areas of concern on the lower end of credit, maybe in cards and autos. Starting to see some strategic sales of commercial real estate, so that that's I think very early innings still there, but seeing more and more of that. Saw the Goldman write down as well, which I think was interesting on on, on office. But generally speaking, tightening margins, uh, liquidity is not in a good spot for the more community and regional institutions, very much hunting for cash and, and looking for new pools of money to put to work. Interesting. And when you say declining margins, that's because interest, you know, because deposit costs are, are rising. Deposit costs are rising and loan growth is slowing. The loans that they're putting on are obviously at higher rates, but they're not making as many of them, as well as deposits kind of on the rise. Got it. Thanks. Nate, what's what's your outlook going into this? And what have you made so far of the six or seven large banks we've had, as well as the the, the regionals today? I'd say similar. You know, on the funding side, like John said, we, we thought it was going to be a tough grind. Not necessarily so much of a shock that, that calls were going to continue to migrate higher. But one of the things that we expected was that betas were going to go over 100%. The median of what we've seen has been about 118. I think we had built 115 into our models which is a real fancy way of saying of every bit of change of Fed funds goes on to their customers. And that's not a great place for banks to be. The smaller guys, it's even more punitive. And a lot of it is because of that mix shift. You're seeing cash move out of non interest bearing funds, which continue to decline. They're down 26% since the end of 21. End of 21, Huge decline there. The only growth in deposits is coming in interest bearing funds and a lot of that in brokered funds. And that's continued. And the small guys being more reliant on higher call CDs, where we're seeing a lot of people market CDs at four or five handles. There's almost 700 banks out there in the market right now with a four plus handle on a CD right now. It's expensive. And the John's point, you could offset that on the loan side, but there's just not that many loans to be made right now to offset that spread, uh, that negative spread. And so margin pressure, and really beyond that, it was what's the outlook? The credit side, we knew it was going to get worse. They've over earning on credit, but it's still pretty good. And it's kind of amazing. You know, the cycle keeps on going, going, going. And we're looking for clues to when this recession we talk about every single day is going to hit, but we still really haven't seen it yet in, in terms of credit. So holding up still pretty well there and, and really more about the guidance and where banks think they'll have to take marks. Thanks. And Nate, how do you define a deposit beta? I think of it as you know going through a bank earnings presentation and you see, oh, from 2015 to 2018, this is what Fed funds did. And then this is what our deposit costs did. It was 30%, 40%. 118% to me sounds very, very high. It is high. You know, when I'm talking about it, they're a good question. We're talking about just the interest bearing funds. We look at it in two ways. We look at it that way, as well as the all in cost of the deposits, because we want to give credit to those who are able to maintain those non interest bearing balances, the free deposits that we all love. Uh, and, and those numbers look lower for sure, but, but they're still creeping up in a big way. But when I say 118, we're talking about the interest bearing product. And the reason why I talk about it that way is, to really measure what are you having to pay to attract and maintain funding today? Because that's where the new cash is coming in. It's not coming in through the non-interest bearing channel. 
And so that would mean uh, 118, let's say, for every 100 basis points increase in the Fed funds rate, 118 basis points of increase in deposit costs for the banks that they would they would have to keep to, 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 to uh, pay their customers. It's uh, possible, maybe even likely, that the Federal Reserve is done hiking. And if they do hike, maybe only one more uh, 25 basis point hike. <laughs> we got For the people listening, we got John uh, just, just crossed his fingers. But tell us about the lag. Is it possible that if the Fed doesn't hike any more, there still will be further increases uh, because of, of that lag? And if so, uh, how much is, is in the pipeline? For sure. And that's the thing. You don't go over 100 unless the Fed is moving really slow or nearly stopped. You know, we were near 100 in Q2. Before that, we were around 70, something like that. When they're moving more quickly, banks won't pass on as much. What we've assumed is Q4 kind of looks like this quarter. So if it continues to play out, we're looking good so far in terms of that forecast around that 115 number. And then it starts to go down a little bit with the idea built into our forecast. Thank God they don't make me forecast for rates. Our economics team does have the Fed cutting at some point <laughs> next year. And, and with that in mind, we think they'll be guiding towards it, right? We'll be seeing hints. They're not just going to wake up one day at a meeting and go cut. Mm -hmm. So banks might not feel as much pressure to, to maintain their depositors and attract new funding. The other thing I would say is, remember, we saw deposit outflows in 22. They declined 2% across the industry. That is an unusual thing. No bank has in their strategic plan, we're going to lose 2% of our deposits. That's not how they, they do things. And those outflows accelerating Q1, some of that panic driven, they've subsided. Now banks are catching up to the rates that are available in the money markets and the short-term treasury markets. So we think those subside. And as that gap narrows, we don't think they're going to, the betas won't be quite as high. That's the other thing. They're not going to drop in a big, big way. But the combo of maybe the Fed telegraphing as well as banks catching up to that spread, the cost pressure won't be quite as much as we are seeing this quarter, next quarter. Right. And the reason that interest rate uh, cost is going up is because the Federal Reserve raised short term interest rates that really targeted that the, uh, deposit pressure. But what about the significant move now in long term interest rates? John, in your re research report, Let's Talk Loans on LinkedIn, uh, you observed that, quote, the long end that's risen to the short end. It's not that the short end has uh, dropped below the long end. It's just that the, the long end has has you know risen to where the, the short end is. That's not what you want to see, I'm sure. And it's creating uh, issues for borrowers and lenders alike. So tell us about why the long end rates going up, why that is an issue. Because if long end rates go up, but the short end rates stay the same, does, is that wouldn't that not change deposit costs and just make loans more profitable to make? Well, uh, when we when I wrote that, the, the two year was right around 5%. I'm staring at it now. It, it has finally gone up to about 521 as I stare at Bloomberg right now. The, the 10 years at 490 uh, today. And there certainly has been more than enough rate volatility with all the things happening in the Middle East and you know, several of the inflationary numbers, retail sales, surprising to, to the upside here the other day. So uh, to your point, though, that that steepness, usually obviously the two-year lower than the 10-year and, and kind of a normal curved rate environment, we, we were inverted as much as almost 100 basis points uh, middle of the year, kind of July-esque. Uh, and now, as I stare at it, we're only 30 basis points inverted with a 521 two-year and, and a 490 10-year. Uh, so you saw the 10-year going to go from four and a quarter all the way up to 490, and the two-year mostly stay stay the same. So that that longer end finally going out, I think, is the the recognition that higher for longer is here. I think the market is kind of finally coming to grips uh, begrudgingly with that. Uh, everybody was just perfectly confident, as we talked to Jack earlier in the year, that the Fed was going to cut rates and we'd be in a recession by now. So that, I think that that market acceptance is what's caused the 10-year to kind of continue to go. I think it does continue to go higher. I'm, I'm curious to see if we do hit 5% here in the relative near future, but some of the, the geopolitical issues could, could cause a flight to quality as well. So to answer your question, I mean, you're feeling it in mortgages. Right. As you think about loan yields, we might see the 8% mortgage in the very, very near future as a result of the of the 10 year approaching 5% in spreads between mortgage rates and, and the 10 year being at, you know, recent history wides. So it's getting passed along to the consumer. That's eventually going to take a bite into the consumer's wallet as well. And then, you know, we'll see kind of where that goes as we get towards the middle of next year. And theoretically, long term interest rates going up and the short term interest rates not changing. That would be good for banks because their funding cost stays the same, but they're earning more on on loans. But that's assuming they can do the same amount of production. Right. 
but they they can't because not a lot of people want an eight percent mortgage. And the folks who are who are calling your team every day, they want to trade their their mortgage or, or or buy mortgages. And is it tell us about how that impacts loan liquidity when you have long term interest rates surging? Fresh off of the MBA annual in, in Philly, just got back yesterday, and I was curious to see what the mood of that conference is going to be. I mean, you know, we've come off of, of two years previously with a $4 trillion mortgage origination market. I, I've joked, I've told this before, but in 2021, that conference was in San Diego. The closing concert was Pitbull on an aircraft carrier <laughs> with a fireworks show. That should have been a leading indicator for us on peak froth in the mortgage market that, you know, pit bull, fireworks show, aircraft carrier. We, we should have seen something then. Unfortunately, I think we know how it all happened. The, the market after two, four trillion dollar years reverted back down to around a, a one seven. And we'll probably finish around something similar this year. And the NBA forecasted another one seven, one eight trillion kind of market. So, you know, roughly cut in half compared to 21 and 22 volumes. So uh, it's not happy times in mortgage land. And those that do have their 3%, 30 year fixed rate mortgage are hanging on to it. So there's not a lot of prepayment coming, there's not a lot of cash coming mm -hmm. back into institutions. That's causing some liquidity concerns for depositories because they're just not gonna get cash flow back. Fewer loans are being made. It means less gain on sale is being generated by institutions as they originate. And, and when they try, to, to trade those loans that they do own at a, at a below market rate, uh, it's often at a discount. Uh, and, and Nate has actually taught me something over the years as we've stared at the portfolio. You might look at loan to deposit or as credit unions call loan to share. Mm -hmm. And that's not a true measure of liquidity of the institution. You actually have to look at you know what's coming due, what's maturing the next three to six months, coupled with the fact on what their mark is on that bond or loan portfolio because it's underwater. They probably own that portfolio at a pretty significant discount. So coming back to your question on liquidity from before, they can't sell the bond, they can't sell the loan at a premium, they're not making as much of it. Prepayment speeds have all slowed. Blessedly, credit has held, and we hope that it stays that way. So those are, those are all things that are kind of factoring very specifically the mortgage market right now as depositories kind of try to walk that line on, on, on that asset. And they tell us tell us more about about that about how the slowdown in prepayment speed has really affected the the runoff of of the balance sheet. Well, I think I think John just came up with a new indicator, the pit bull indicator. <laughs> so, pitbull performs, then you're seeing a fifty percent decline in originations in the next couple of years. So let, let's you heard it here first, Nate. You heard it here first. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I I think when you see rates go up like that, a couple of things. I mean, one. The start off we talked about, we don't see funding calls move up. I, I'm not necessarily in that camp, not necessarily so much on the 10 year, but on that two five, I mean, that's where you see CDs competing with in the treasury market in a lot of ways. So I think that does lead the pressure, particularly for small banks who are pretty reliant on, on CDs. But the second thing is, you know, you're kicking out a lot of your portfolio, the portfolio is extending. So you're sitting there on these assets with lower yields for longer periods of time, and you're just looking at duration risk in your face. And you could get ahead of that if you were putting a lot of new money to work at high rates, but you're not doing that. You're letting bond portfolios run off because of liquidity issues. And then secondly, there's not a new lot of loans to make, as we talked about earlier. So you're not really able to offset that and and get any of the benefit that you would get from a, a build up in, in rates on the long end of the curve. So you all always hear steep curve is a good thing for banks. It kind of depends on what else is going on and with funding need and liquidity being as precious as it is, I'm not so sure that's the case. But an inverted curve, which is what we had, that's not good for banks. Or maybe is it? I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think it's necessarily. No, no definitely good. not. No, no. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's necessarily the, the place you want to be. I mean, wh what banks want, they like higher rates. You hear that being talked about. And a lot of people saying that people are wrong, that higher rates are good for banks. They are as long as it's steady. <laughs> what they don't need... Right. Is, is the pull the ripcord kind of move that we saw in the last 18 months. That is not a good scenario for banks, unless you built your balance sheet for that, but nobody built their balance sheet for 550 basis points of increase in, in the amount of time we saw. And Jack, we joked about that on the last call. In a perfect world, if all the CEOs and CFOs could rewind back to March of 22 before the Fed really kind of took off and not bought all the bonds, not made all the loans that were underwater and could have just left it all in cash. Well, they'd love right now because they could go invest at seven, eight percent kind of yields and, and crush it.
But then there um, wouldn't be any pit bull. <laughs> well said. Yes, that would have been a tragedy to have lost that. But um, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened was that that money was put to work uh, quickly and um, and unfortunately at a much lower rate environment. And because interest rates have risen so much from when these loans were made or when these securities were bought, there's a, if if securities were marked to market, there would be a lot of unrealized losses for loans. They're you know your world, uh, John. They're not marked to market, but in securities, whether it's available for sale or or held to maturity, they do uh, report that and available for, for sale. That that impacts uh, you know uh, book equity. How much of a problem is that, Nate? You know, I've you know took a screenshot of Bank of America's. It has 130 billion dollars in unrealized losses for held to maturity. And that sounds pretty scary, but you know, given the, the the incredible breadth of, of Bank of America, they they can handle that. But how do how sh- how do you think about that loss? Is that a real loss? Uh, if they you know don't realize it, which they very likely won't, is it an economic loss? How do you think about balancing that against the uh, you know supposed gain of on the liability side of having low interest uh, uh, deposits when when rates go up? Well, the last thing you said is what bankers always come back with, and that's the problem with fair value is that the value of their deposits aren't recognized, and that that's fair. I'm also in the camp that banks are not going to have to mark their balance sheets to market, and that we're not going to see that, and that you're not going to see forced sales unless there's a liquidity need. And I don't think the vast majority of institutions in the country are there, particularly the biggest guys. What it is is a really good measure of duration risk and and how much you're going to have to sit on those low yielding assets for a long period of time. And so it shows up in your earnings stream, straight up, whether or not it's that $130 billion mark, your your NIM is showing it today and your funding costs continue to grind higher and you're having to sit on that one five, one seven, two percent yield, whatever it is, and that's a negative spread uh, relative to where they are today. So that's generally how I think about it. Beyond that, and this is maybe less so for the big guys, but there are regulatory implications of it. Regulators are telling us that, okay, it doesn't impact your regulatory capital if you're a non-GSIB, but it does impact your tangible common equity. And once you go below 5%, we're going to start kicking the tires. We're going to downgrade you on, on your liquidity rating and exams. And that has real implications. Generally, it means first and foremost, slow growth. Secondly, start ramping up compliance. Thirdly, start running different stress testing. And it gets worse as it goes lower. So it, it does have real implications, even if it isn't necessarily technically in your earnings stream. But I would argue that it is, but it's largely a earnings and operational issue. With the last caveat that you asked in the question about EV, B of A, everybody's asking that question about B of A, and it's an uh, overhang on the stock. And I think anybody who has a massively underwater bond portfolio right now and is publicly traded, it will be a massive overhang on the stock, on the stock even if it's an in an HTM portfolio where they don't have to market every quarter. And so held to maturity available for sale. Tell, tell us if it's in available for sale, you, do, you don't have, it doesn't count, have to count for regulatory purposes unless you're a GSIB, but it does count for book, book value. That's right. And so what we've seen for the GSIBs is 70% of their portfolio is in held to maturity because they didn't want to have that volatility in the regulatory capital. And some built it bigger than others. Some stayed short, some you know went longer to, to build some sort of earning stream when rates were low, but they all utilized it in some measure because they didn't want that going to regulatory capital. But they're not alone. The smaller banks, and, and by smaller, I mean just below that GSIP level, so pretty much everybody else have utilized it as well, just not as heavily. Uh, HTM portfolios are about 25% of their securities portfolio, and they did it for the same reason that they just, not the regulatory capital, but they didn't want the volatility and their tangible book value. I think HTM is going to be looked at differently after this cycle. Mm -hmm. It certainly already is from from the investment community. I think the regulatory community is starting to look at that when they do internal exams, and that's impacting their liquidity ratings. I think banks going forward will rely on that less than they have, particularly the smaller ones when they don't have the regulatory capital issue. With one other comment, the Basel III endgame will make the impact regulatory capital for everybody over 100 billion. So it's not going to be just the GSIBs. It's going to be a larger population. Say that last bit again about, about the Basel III endgame. So updates to bank banking regulation. So once those rules go in place, and that's years away, the changes in the value of your bond portfolio, or AFS portfolio, will impact your regulatory capital. And right now, that's only for the GSIBs. It's for the 100 billion plus, though, in the proposed rules. 
I think those are not finalized. They're getting tremendous pushback. I think some form of them will come. I think this is one area they're going to have a really hard time pushing against. Get, when you look at the banks that failed, they all had massively underwater portfolios and they all have liquidity problems. And this is something that I think regulators wanted to impose post GFC, but they just got pushed back on. And so they capped at the GSIBs. I think the $100 billion group is going to have a hard time, though, fighting that fight. So at least that piece, if I had to be a betting man, I would say sticks. But the held to maturity would still uh, be in place. So, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, for example, huge, huge losses on um, securities, but a lot of that was in held to maturity. So, uh, you know, a, a bank that has, if, if, a, if a bank was under this new Basel III endgame, they, couldn't they just move it to held to maturity or sort of you know, hide those losses uh, in the, in that little HTM sleeve? I don't know if I'd call it hiding it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're talking about B of A and their portfolio, and you have the exact number, and we all yeah. do, right? We're all talking As I said about the word hide, I knew it wasn't the right word. No, yeah. no, no. no. <laughs> I, I understand your point, though, and, and I think it will be looked at differently. I honestly think that that experience and, and what the B of A's of the world who have done, who were a little bit longer duration, say, than a JPM did with those HTM portfolios, I think you're going to say going forward, I'm not going to get paid for it. The street's going to be at least skeptical of it for the next five, 10 years. So maybe I'm not going to take that risk. I'm not going to take that rate risk. And I, I can't predict completely, but I just feel like we're going to look at our bond portfolios more for liquidity, which is what they always kind of were for and less for income than we did during 2021. But let's not forget, you know, deposits outpace loans by $4 trillion in 2021. We never had seen anything like that. Amazing amount of liquidity hit the system. And everybody was telling banks, you can't sit on this because you're going to earn nothing. So does that mean you should have gone as far out the curve as you, as you could? Probably not. But it's real easy at this point to look at that and say that that was a crazy decision uh, to be made. You kind of have to look at what was happening. And then also, if you look at rate expectations, as late as December of 21, people had the Fed topping out at like 2%. So so nobody, every everybody who's claiming they saw this coming, where was your estimate for five and a half? Nobody was there. They go back to that person, that balance sheet that I said that held it all in cash, right? And, right. and none of them did, right? So right. I, I look forward to finding that unicorn balance sheet, but I hadn't found it yet. So I'll keep hunting for it. Right. And, and John, let's bring uh, your world loans into the picture. So loans are not marked to market. So is there any, any distinction between available for sale or, or held to maturity? And when are losses or gains realized for loans? It, when it is a sale? And might that be an incentive or a disincentive to doing a transaction? I mean, I think you referenced earlier that you know banks who made very long duration mortgage loans or you know very low coupon mortgage loans, they want to hold on to it. Yeah, I mean, the loan portfolio usually carries a, a liquidity premium because the loan is less liquid than the bond. And that's generally true. And you can't move it as quickly. It's not T plus two. It's more like T plus 45 days to get a loan trade done. So I, I think, you know, those are, are fairly well-known kind of items as you look at the at the whole loan market. Uh, along those lines, though, as as an institution works their way through the bond portfolio and they realize it's at a loss, and let's just be generous and say the, the portfolio is 10 points underwater. They work their way around to the loan portfolio because they still probably own it at par. They haven't likely marked it down, even despite the fact that the coupon isn't all that dissimilar to the bond. Uh, and then they come to us and they say, hey, we'd, we'd love to, to price that particular loan. And then when we show them pricing, they're still subject to current market rates. And, and someone might say, okay, you have a, a 30% or a 3% 30-year fixed rate loan. Great. The price is 78 cents on the dollar. Should they choose to proceed and actually do that transaction, they still have to recognize that loss on sale, assuming they haven't marked that loan down or they don't have any reserves or gains that they can take against it. So it's the same problem. It's just when do they recognize uh, that impairment if they choose to mark it down, uh, which most don't, um, or if they choose to, uh, they might mark it down for credit impairment reasons, but not usually for interest rate reasons. So when you look at the liquidity of the loan markets, if mortgages aren't moving that much, what's moving? You know, what what is the when you get a call, what are the odds that they want? What do they want to buy or sell? It's on the shorter end. Autos have done well. Prime, everything Prime. HELOCs have had an exceedingly strong year, which makes a lot of sense with all the trapped equity in properties and and not wanting to give up your three percent thirty year fixed rates. And if you have the ability to originate, you know, Prime quality, very picky commercial real estate, there's been some some strength. 
if you can find a, a well underwritten space, because a lot of people have left the commercial real estate market. They've pulled back, they've tightened credit guidelines. So if you feel that you know that market better than maybe some of the other larger institutions, we have some people wanting to kind of push into, into that area. I, I personally think that's a, a, a tough trade. But uh, on the origination effort, there seems to be those tightening of guidelines that's kind of opened up that space. Might that be uh, the private lender space, the non-bank space? We don't have as much vision into that, but I keep reading about mm -hmm. that as well. Yeah, but usually more, uh, you know, uh, uh, $50 million in down commercial real estate, even in the, the small business, even the one to $5 million individual loans. But somewhere in that kind of context is the space that we often see. Got it. Well, you know, Nate, now, now's my time to ask you to take out your, your crystal ball. Sort of how do you see, you know, we, we've got a good description of where things are, where, where things have been. How do you see the banking system evolve, given, given all these pressures and issues we talked about? Banks rarely move fast, and, and I don't think it's going to be that different. I mean, I think it's kind of a grind on, on a lot of things. I think you're going to see slow deposit growth. And, and not as many in the way of outflows. The big guys have continued to see outflows, but I think there are going to be more outliers there. Uh, banks are going to thin what they have with higher cost. Slow marginal loan growth and probably even declining. You, you hadn't seen many banks that we spoke with be willing to, to back off of their growth goals. We're hearing more rethink that, whether it's due to credit concerns or the cost of funding new loans. Or as I've spoken about with John and his colleagues before, they're at least trying to price it higher now. So if they lose the business, fine. But if they get it, at least they're getting paid for it against uh, the cost of funding that new credit. And that's where I think it is sort of on the basic blocking and tackling. And then I think credit's kind of a, a slow bleed. And that doesn't mean it's really bad. I just look at it as sort of a normal credit cycle. But you hear everybody talking about they're going to have to blow everything out. This is what the mark is. That's not the way banks work. The regulators have said they're not going to force them to do that. The one, the two areas where that could be faster, and these are going to be kind of outliers, you're hearing more about funds being raised to help banks with either loss trades in their bond portfolio or commercial real estate credits. Not everybody will want to do that, but in some cases, it'll make sense. And so you could see some more paper moving next year on that. And the second would be M&A activity, which is absolutely abysmal right now, but in a world where Earnings are under pressure, and we think you know they fall 10%, give or take, this year, uh, and fall a little bit more next year. You've got a lot of bank boards looking forward and saying, we're not going to grow earnings the next 12 months. We have it the last 12 months. Let's do something. And there are some challenges there, whether it's regulatory, whether it's the, the capital hits associated with the marks you have to take on a target's balance sheet. But once those marks are taken, why are you going to sit on lower yielding paper? So I do think you'll see a little bit more clearing of, of some things next year. But I don't think it's going to be as fast as a lot from what you hear uh, in the investment community of the marks banks will have to recognize, notwithstanding what we heard about Goldman or some of the big banks when it came to reserves related to, to office properties or things like that. Today's interview is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio, your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and access a range of Web3 services all in one place. Overseeing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be very complicated. MetaMask Portfolio solves this by giving you the reins to manage your crypto from a single decentralized application or DAP. Just connect to MetaMask Portfolio to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs, and you can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge, and stake crypto assets at competitive rates right within the app from a vetted list of providers. No more jumping between dozens of sites and apps. MetaMask Portfolio lets you do more in Web3 your way, giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all in one place. Manage your portfolio your way with MetaMask Portfolio. Click the link in the description of today's episode to get started. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. And they put the credit le level, level of, of credit delinquencies right now in context. They've risen a tremendous amount from exceptionally low levels. So as uh, you know, Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan reminded us that they, you know, levels are right now at 2019 levels, which historically for Bank of America was a low level. That that's that's one bank. But what are the levels of defaults and credit stress, and how do they compare to the pre 2020 period? That's pretty much all banks, and and I would say in most cases they're still below pre pandemic levels. You hear so much about cards, for instance. Oh, they've grown 400, 500 percent. Well, we're still 60 some basis points below the pre-pandemic average. So we're still over earning effectively on credit. I don't think that means that credit is perfect, 
I do believe that we did some things right this time or heading into this one when compared to some other vicious cycles, which makes me feel better about whatever is to come. But the liquidities are still relatively low. They're just not really seeing a lot of cracks yet. And, and John's heard me say this before. It's amazing what happens when you throw $10 trillion at a market between Fed stimulus and, and, and Fed balance sheet expansion. So look at everybody's view of the economy. You know, We thought we'd be seeing a slowdown. We thought we'd see the consumer getting hit. It's just not happening yet. And I think a lot of it is that we had so much wind in our back. But some of the things we did right, our underwriting was better. We have more equity in deals. And the other thing that I tell groups too is that we scrubbed our portfolios heavily during the pandemic. Doesn't mean we did everything right, but it's not like we were going with blinders on for a decade heading into this period. So that gives me some confidence that we're not heading towards some sort of severe downturn. When you say scrubbed your portfolio, you're talking about credit risks. Oh yes, oh yes. And I mean, we we put a lot of stuff on deferrals. You know, deferrals peaked at you know ten percent of loans, but we scrubbed anything we were worried about. Ran stress tests, ran loss loss assumptions, ran all kinds of shock scenarios, and it was effectively the credit cycle that never was. Uh, while you saw a big reserve build, it all came back down to the bottom line. So a lot of loans that we made or bars we had worked with, we had recently stressed, which when I think back to the worst cycles, you had this period of very benign activity where we convinced ourselves we were never going to lose money again. Of course, that was wrong. So that gives me Again, some added confidence, not, not that nothing is coming. We've got loss content tripling for community banks, but off of such a low level, it's just a normal credit cycle. Are you talking about reserves there? About how the reserves for the losses, the losses didn't happen, and then they could earn it back as is income. It, when, during the pandemic, that's right. Yep, that's right. That's right. And, and some of that's due to the, to the res- changes in the reserve methodology. Cecil, yes. Yep. Everybody loves Cecil. Oh boy, you talk to bankers about Cecil, they'll get really excited. Jamie Diamond loves Cecil. <laughs> oh, they all they all love Cecil. It doesn't matter what bank you find. Uh, I don't know anybody who likes it, but basically, banks over reserved by sixty billion dollars. It was a sixty billion dollar headwind to, to earnings in twenty, and then in twenty one, fifty eight billion fell to the bottom line. So that's the peak of volatility. I don't know if we'll see something like that because we're not going to have a complete economic shutdown like we did during the pandemic, but you can see a scenario. And in fact, this is what we've assumed in, in our forecast is that reserve building is going to be a real headwind to earnings over the next two years. And that a lot of that loss content won't happen. And so they'll get a boost earnings in 25. And does that prediction sort of have baked into it a analysis about a slowdown in 2024 and 2025 where reserves are built and then the reserves don't happen. And as you come out of that cycle, Pretty much, yes, yes. You know, we we've assumed, and again, as I said, they don't make me forecast rates, thank goodness. But I'm also relying on our economics team, who sees unemployment ticking up, but a little bit worse than what the Fed says, but that's still pretty low. You know, is is one of John's colleagues he introduced me to called it a slow session, and that's kind of where we are, not in this just sort of ho hum downturn, nothing to get really really freaked out about, uh, but just a normalization of of credit. Uh, over the next few years. Thanks. John, are you, what camp are you in? Are you in the slow session normalization camp or do you think things might get a little bit worse? I believe when we first spoke, that was a time where not a lot was moving in, in loan land and you had a somewhat pessimistic outlook, but maybe you've, you've brightened since then. Well, when we were first talking, it was that the SBB kind of mini banking crisis mm-hmm. and, you know, right there on March 8th, boots on the ground in LA. I mean, it was a little too real where a guy walks in with a piece of paper going, are you seeing this? I mean, is this really happening? So I am surprised that the economy has held and the consumer has continued to spend as strongly and as well as it has. I would have thought we would have seen, you know, higher losses, uh, maybe not necessarily recessionary, but getting closer to that. You know, I would have thought that higher rates would have been more into the consumer, but I have been more of a proponent of higher for longer. I think Chair Powell has been exceedingly transparent that he's going to keep rates up here for a while. You know, when you think of the mortgage business, I mean, I think the the mantra right now is kind of survive until 25. I mean, it's a really tough space out there for it. I think we'll continue to kind of see strategic sellers of commercial real estate. I think we, we mentioned the, the Goldman bit where, mm-hmm. you know, a, a write down of say 50% on, on office and 15% on the, on the remainder of the portfolio of, of, of non-office. I mean, I think that's 
that's smart. They're using a, a good economy to take, you know, additional reserves to plan for a potential rainy day if and when the economy does finally hit the wall. Uh, but the consumer has been buoyed by really low mortgage payments. That's been a headwind for them. Ten trillion dollars that, that Nate mentioned before certainly uh, didn't hurt the consumer along the way. I, I think one question I continue to kind of search and hunt for is when are all those reserves going to be spent? You know, some say we're there. Some say we're there just for the you know only the the twenty percent wealthiest uh, of Americans have any reserves left. The the remaining eighty percent are starting to struggle, and so that normalization of credit is happening. Uh, and you know we'll start to see that kind of bubble up into to Q1 and Q2 of next year. And Nate, what do you think about the levels of excess savings? I've, and there are two communities who talk about excess savings. One are the economists and the the macro folks who you know have an aggregate sense of the data. And you know I, I could pull up in, in a few you know seconds from from Fred to the St. Louis Fed. They have a thing that says excess savings. And then there's the banker community where we're you two gentlemen are from. And you're saying, actually, no, my clients are the deposits and I'm seeing something different. And actually, there are more excess savings than this depletion of excess savings narrative and chart from Fred.com would, would suggest. Let's not forget the the Fed just revised, the San Francisco Fed just revised that and said, actually, excess savings are a couple hundred billion higher than we thought. That's a big number. That's a big number. We've been tracking that a lot, and and our number had seemed to be high. And I'm kind of wish I'd stop. Pub- I hadn't stopped publishing it because I was worried that we were looking at it wrong. And what, the way we did it is we just looked at okay, what's what was the pre-pandemic average on monthly dollars saved over a five-year period, and then we assumed any dollar above that was excess, and just ran that against and accumulated it. And so we were running a little high, and and like I said, I stopped doing it, and and now I wish I, I kept going because it's more in line with that revised number. John's point, though, about what that distribution looks like really matters uh, in terms of the health of the consumer from the credit side. In terms of what's sitting in bank accounts, you're hearing banks saying that they're working those numbers down, that balances are still slightly above for some of their customers. But I think a lot of it has gone to the money market and treasury market and continues. That shift continues. In terms of the consumer's health, though, from a credit side, they have some cushion there. Again, the dispersion matters. The other thing I would note, when it comes to mortgages, while origination activity is down, that's a bad thing from a growth standpoint. The reason why it's down is because everybody got a 2.5% three-year mortgage. So our debt-to-income ratios look pretty good. Really They're strong. Yep, really strong. Also well below the 40-year average, one and a half percentage points. That's hard to lose money if you haven't borrowed as much. So that, that should be a good thing for the consumer's resilience. On the flip side, we've got student loan debt repayments restarting, and that's 24 million Americans paying 300, 350 a month. And that could be a headwind the spending activity. But I'm trying to be a little optimistic about that one and saying, maybe that allows us to hold where we are from a rate standpoint, contain inflation, and maybe we can even get to a point where we could get a small cut or something. And it won't have to be because things are really heading down uh, a negative lane. So I think the consumer is pretty strong. Yes, they've been buoyed by a lot of government money, but they also did a good job with their own balance sheets and borrowed when rates were low. And John, earlier you said that the the mantra in the mortgage community is survive until 2025. And I just want to stress for the audience that it is not a a credit issue, a subprime 2006-7. It's it's they made mortgages that, you know, used to yield 3% and now yield 7%. But is it that when their issue is that their funding has gone up so much and that the origination has gone down. Well, that and, you know, the, the mortgage industry hired thousands of loan officers and credit officers. And, you know, it just again, coming off the MBA, uh, Mike Pratt-Antoni made the statement that, you know, that correction in, in employment is maybe two thirds of the way through as we probably had too many loan officers, too many credit officers, not enough volume. So, you know, in that regard, the mortgage industry is is hurting because of the, you know, cut in half origination volumes that we've had. Now, to your point, though, the performance of the asset mortgages, I actually think, are the winner. If we did have some sort of a, a recessionary or credit event, I think mortgages underwriting has been incredibly sound, very well documented, you know, coming out of Dodd-Frank in 2014 and QM and everything that went along with it. We, we've seen historically low Delinquency rates and charge-off rates and mortgages, equity in homes have held uh, surprisingly so throughout the year. And, and I actually think mortgages and, and one of the consumer sectors is a winner. And Joe, we talked about a little bit. What about commercial real estate 
loans. How much origination is going on? How much trading is going on? How much haircuts are, are sellers having to take? And is it still that dynamic that that you outlined for for us in the summer of trophies and trash, where if you have you know the best building in the world, you, a loan can sell for that, but and you know likewise a, a building that has a lot of issues, a loan will sell, but nothing really in the middle would would move. Very frozen, exceedingly so. Uh, not much trading at all, and you know, trophies and trash has obviously got a, a number of smiles along the way, but I think that's still you know, the, the the part of the conversation that institutions are struggling with. There's not as many originations. There's not as many valuations. We don't even use the word loan to value anymore. The only thing that matters is cash flow. And then we're really, really stressing with our customers in the next 12 to 18 months. Look at when those loans are coming due. We're seeing a ton of maturity defaults, uh, but the loans are still cash flowing, which is good. They're just not cash flowing at kind of a current market level. So I think institutions on the credit side of commercial are looking at that very strongly and are trying to understand, is this going to be a borrower that can continue to work with me? Is it going to be a borrower or a sponsor who can put more equity in to the real estate? And, you know, can I, maybe I can't take them up to a 7 or 8% cap rate, but maybe I can take them up to a 6% cap rate and kind of limp through some of this. Maybe I can do interest only for a year or two with them to kind of work through it. But we're trying to kind of inch that market back up as, as cap rates are uh, still uh, readjusting to the, to the current commercial rate market. And Nate, how are you thinking about uh, commercial real estate as um, um, today and, and over the next uh, few days, regional banks are going to be re- reporting, some of which are very big into commercial real estate, which have some of these issues that, that, that John talked about uh, as well. So you got the credit risk for, for CRE. And then also, is there an interest rate risk c- component as well, where you know these, these loans have some, some duration uh, as well? I mean, I think there's a lot of nuances in it, and you have to think about it from institution-specific. You have to think about it location-specific. You have to think about it subcategory of the asset class-specific, and then the loan terms there. And you've seen some things where it's all being painted as a broad brush as, as if it was all high-rise office. And, and I don't think that that's really the case, including the fact of people saying that regional community banks own 70% of the market, which is not true. They might own 70% of CRE bank loans, but Life insurance companies are just as big as that entire group collectively. Plus, you've got private credit being out there that's massive and kind of a black box, to be honest. doesn't mean that they've done anything necessarily wrong, but we just don't have near the level of insight in there. I think what we're going to see over the next few weeks is more disclosure and granularity around office exposures. And maybe beyond that, on what the breakdown of portfolios are, I don't think the street's really going to believe that though for a few quarters. It's going to be a total show me story. So I think we'll start to see haircuts on office and maybe the stronger try to be aggressive and move that out. We've seen that from the big banks, but the rest of it's going to be like what John said, where working with each individual bar and some of that might be extending things out and it might be a long slog. That's what I expect, especially with a lot of these guys. As you said, you know, this is a core part of their business and it's 60, 70% of their portfolio But it's not all office. Some of it's owner-occupied small business loans that is just backed by CRE's collateral. So they're going to have to go on and try to tell that message, and it'll take a while to play out. While each good bit of economic news, Jack, you know, extends that next cut, you know, that next chance that we'll get lower rates, and while that's painful, higher for longer is hurting us, each bit of positive news in the economy is a gift to some Mm -hmm. of these institutions where they can extend and pretend, and they can make higher reserves on troubled assets, and they can work through that with their borrowers and kind of continue to communicate with them. So again, I think that's something that a lot of our institutions are having real heavy conversations with at ALCO, Credit Committee, you know, and being honest and and real about what's going on with an individual borrower sponsor situation and and working through that. Nate, you brought up a really good point about how some commercial loans are commercial loans, they just happen to be backed by commercial real estate. And collateral is is almost, almost always a good thing, I would imagine. So is it possible that people say, oh, I, I don't want CRE loans, I want CNI loans, commercial and industrial loans, when actually, there are some CNI loans that are backed by CRE, which would, it's a good thing. That That's about half of them, in fact. So and, and I don't think that that's talked about that much, you know, in the banking community, I think that's very well understood. But it's about half of the CRE credits that regional community banks report. And if you think about it, if you're winning against a business and the business is fine, so what? Who cares if the property value dropped 20%? It might have gone up 30% since you made the loan originally. You're lending against the business and its viability as a business. Now, there are businesses that 
might be a little bit more sensitive to the location and foot traffic and things like that, but uh, not every business. So, so I just think it takes a lot of a lot of more nuance in the discussion than we're hearing from a lot of people. So bo both of us, we talked about the slowdown in loan originations so far. Nate, how much of that is because the banks just can't find a good credit for the yield that they require? In other words, they want to make the loans, they just can't find the, the right loans to make versus they can't make the loans because their balance sheet is shrinking because deposits are leaving. I, I don't know if it's just those two things. I think I think those are kind of the, the goal puts on the ends and there's some in between. Uh, so is their balance sheet shrinking? I would say closer in. Is it worth it given the cost of funding the new loan? And can I price it where I want to? And maybe I'm passing on that. Am I getting pressure from my regulators given the focus that they have on not only liquidity and things like liquid, liquid assets over uninsured deposits, but my CRE concentration, which we're seeing that come up a lot again. If my CRE loans are over 300% of our risk-based capital, I'm going to face greater scrutiny. Maybe I've been okay with that, but maybe I'm not that crazy about that today. We've even seen some banks try to shrink below that threshold. So I think you've got some of that, but then you've got some on the demand side. You know, Maybe you've got people not looking to raise their hands because they're reading everything we're reading. They're hearing a lot of concern about a potential slowdown. And they're even watching what some of our guys in bank lands are doing. They're saying, hey, we're facing revenue pressures. We're going to cut costs. We're going to trim headcount. They're starting to go, maybe we shouldn't expand right now. You know, We feel okay right now, but we're a little bit worried. So I, mean, I think you've got a bunch of different things going on, on on each side there. But it all leads to a place where you're not seeing a lot of strong growth. It's funny because in, in loan land, the, the loan officer is always the one driving growth, right? You never want to take your loan officers and your frontline people and tell them, hey, I'm slowing down. But you've got the CFOs and the treasurers right now just standing up and down and screaming, saying, I, I got to get my funding sources sorted out right now. And my margin's getting hammered at the moment. So I, I've watched this war between production and finance for the better part of my career. And maybe for the first time in at least a decade, if not over a decade, Am I finally seeing the finance people win and, and having to tell the loan officers out there and the production guys and the frontline guys, hold up, slow down. I need, I got to get my rates right. I got to get my margin right. I got my funding costs under control because I, you know, I, I, I got to earn a margin on this. And, and that's, to, to Nate's point, I'm not hearing as much of the worry about credit, although I am reading and, and feeling people kind of tighten credit, but I think that's also kind of tied to, to the funding portion of it as well. And then does that loan now qualify in this new higher interest rate environment? Does that commercial real estate cash flow at you know today's cap rate, does that residential mortgage work on a $3,000 a month mortgage? Does an auto loan work at a $1,000 a month payment? Those, I think, are questions that, that a lot of folks are asking. And are those customers more cash stretched than, to Nate's point earlier, you know, anybody who made a loan three, four years ago at a very, very low interest rate environment, they're in a much better balance sheet position than somebody making a loan today in a more inflationary environment. Is there any time over the course of your career that reminds you of the current moment or does it just stand out as it's its, its own time? I do feel the shrink conversation, but not the shrink conversation from the great financial crisis. And, and the deleveraging that we felt was very credit related back in 2008, 2009, 2010. This is, seems to be more funding and earnings related, capital related. So, and that's only the very area. I mean, to, to Nate's point, we're only just kind of starting to have that particular conversation. So, and Nate, what would you think on that? I, I agree. I think it feels extremely different than the GFC. You know, I started covering in the early aughts. And if I go back trying to study history, I guess the closest would be the 90s. But thankfully, I think most balance sheets are positioned better than what we saw with SNLs then. Though right. we are hearing some stories uh, of, of balance sheets getting broken and you've seen some NIMS get absolutely crushed this quarter. And you'll probably see some outliers like that. But it, it, it's it's such a different, it's an interest rate shock. It's not a credit shock. It's not it's a credit a issue, different. yeah. It's a very, very different thing. And go back to that time period. John and I have talked about this. There are so many stories you gave about where people are doing crazy things <laughs> leading up to GFC. And I don't remember seeing that the last few years. You know, you might have had people grow a little too much and maybe get too bloated, but really they took rate risk and they took rate risk and safe credits. You know, they, they've gotten burned on treasuries and agency debt. It's a very different conversation. 
I always appreciate it when I'm on a, a conversation with Nate because he remembers what it was like in in May of 21, right? When it was all about earnings, earnings, earnings had nothing to do uh, with interest rate risk and inflation was still transitory and uh, nobody knew that the Fed was really going to just, you know, take off. And so those CFOs today, you know, are being judged maybe harshly. But if you go back to that moment, it was a very different conversation in that regard. And they're probably being judged by, in some cases, the same analysts who were asking them about having uh, higher net interest margins. So, Nate, does it make a difference if the issue is on the credit side or on the interest rate risk side for for the assets? Yeah, I absolutely. I'm going to get paid back. (laughs) It just is going to take time. And it might be painful. It's an earnings issue. It's not a safety and soundness issue. And I keep saying that. When, whenever I'm talking with people. And I, and I mean that broadly. Mm-hmm. It was broadly a safety and soundness issue when it's a credit issue in 08. Well, you know, we were handing out money, as I heard somebody saying, there were people buying houses that shouldn't have been buying watches. And, <laughs> and, and, and that was definitely the case. And you know, we were doing the same thing with construction and development loans. Mm-hmm. It's the reason why we had 88 banks fail in Metro Atlanta in a pretty short time period. It's just nothing like that. So I think the difference is they can earn their way out of this with ugly earnings in some cases. Not everybody, but in some cases, even those who might have broken balance sheets. And some will be worse than that. But I do think it makes a difference because as long as your liquidity is not fleeting and it's stabilizing now, it's, you're really just talking about an ugly margin issue opposed to completely blowing up. So the total difference between I'm not being paid back and I'm being paid back. It's just the cash flow isn't worth as much. But just to put, put put a few numbers on it in an accounting sense. Let's say a hundred. You have a hundred mortgage loans, and I have a hundred mortgage loans. I eighty percent of my loans get paid back in in full, and I have no interest rate issues. And twenty percent don't get 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 paid back. You a hundred percent of your loans get paid back, but because of interest rate risk, your loans are only worth eighty dollars. Aren't our assets worth the same? The street might say so today, but they shouldn't because the first bank fails. Because your capital is 10%. So you just gave me a 20% loss. Now, will you take that all at once? No. So, you know, you might be able to earn your way out o- over time. But I, I think it's just a, a, a different scenario than, than that. Whereas you can look at, okay, I've got a razor thin spread. And you have some people saying, look at how underwater these portfolios are. They can't earn their way out of it today. Well, they're still earning a margin. They're still earning today. It's just not a great one. It's the slow melting ice cube, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about here is that slow bleed on margin as opposed to just the sharp cut of mm-hmm. being forced to sell. I mean, First Republic, you know, a bulletproof balance sheet in a lot of ways, but a portfolio that was underwater, an inability to raise cash by liquidating assets fast enough caused them to fall into trouble. Nothing like 2008, purely interest rate risk. I mean, that was... And a run on deposits, obviously, but that was that was the challenge that kind of brought one of the best credit stories in in the banking world to come around. Nate, if if I can ask you about an in- individual, if if you can't talk about it, we we can just move on. But uh, Goldman Sachs really stands out for having to reverse its its, its strategy of going into c- consumer banking. How do you think about the the future of Goldman Goldman Sachs? With the caveat that I don't spend a ton of time with Goldman and other people have said this, but I think it's spot on. It is so hard to build a consumer franchise. It takes a really, really long time. And I think they got a nice education on that. Not to be too harsh on it, but I think that's probably a, a fair point. And I think they're trying to to figure out what that path forward looks like. But I mean, Goldman's been Goldman and made lots of money through lots of cycles and found ways to do it. So I'm not exactly counting them out. That's not a comment about the stock or, or anything like mm-hmm. that. But people who've said to me for years, you know, you might have worked with anybody, but it, at the end of the day, you might call Goldman if you're going to sell your company. I, I, I don't think that they've they that their brand has gone away in that context. So it kind of remains to be seen, but it, they, they've gotten their education on the consumer and, and they're looking forward to, to kind of moving on. Thanks. While we're, we're talking about investment banking, so investment banking, a flurry of activity in 2020, 2021, big slowdown in, in 2022. Things were looking better just from the, the Q3 earnings, JP Morgan, Bank of America. But today we got a little bit of a surprise from Morgan Stanley. How do you think about 
the, the your short to midterm outlook on the on the cap the business of, of of capital markets? I think we need to know a few things, right? We need to know where is peak rates. Okay, we're a little bit closer there. I think that that helps people figure out where things go. But there's still so much economic uncertainty. I mean, honestly, we haven't gone through this kind of experiment call it where you've thrown a ton of cash at the economy, inflation is red hot, and then you raise rates really fast with the hope that you're going to temper it down. And oh yeah, there's a land war in Europe and now one in the Middle East too. So, you know, we've done this a bunch of times. No, we haven't. So I think that is all bad for deal activity. That's uncertainty, 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 and that is bad for deal activity. We were starting to see it come up, but I think we're getting closer. You know, you're seeing those pipelines build as you alluded to. 24 has got to be better than 23 because it was pretty bad. And, and so I, I feel like it's getting closer. As long as you have some idea of where things are going, you're going to be more likely to support transactions, whether it's an IPO, whether it's M&A or anything like that. And I think for much of the last year and a half, we just really didn't have much of a handle on it. We've had so many people debating both sides. So markets need more certainty. I think we're getting closer, uh, but they also need really stable economies to, to be gangbusters and low acquisition calls in terms of financing. And we're not we're not there. So better, but probably not gangbusters. No, we, we hosted our, our whole loan conference about a month or so back. And, and Bill Salmon, who's one of our investment bankers, made the statement, if you look at the duck on the pond, it looks like everything's smooth and not lots going on. But under the water, there's a whole lot of feet pedaling and a whole lot of conversations being had. I think that's true. I think that's true in regards to M&A. And, and while, you know, Nate mentioned we're, we're at, you know, really, really low transaction volumes there, there are a ton of conversations being had. And if we can get the market to, to behave and sit still for a minute and the valuations can make sense and, and there's the, so a little bit more certainty, a little bit more stability to come into the world, I think you'll see a flurry uh, of that happen. Uh, not that volatility has done anything, but slow to, not slow down in the last several weeks. So, you know, it's maybe wishful thinking, but there's, that's not to say the conversations aren't being had today. Well, and I'll pile on to that too. In the depository space in particular, I totally agree with everything John just said. I, I, I think that I've been putting it this way. I feel like you're getting more boards getting closer to capitulation. And I, I mentioned the point of looking forward, not seeing much earnings growth and not seeing much on the way back. I think you're going to see more boards, bank boards, feel like they need to do something in 24 for sure. When you're talking about the broader capital markets activity, that might be a little more murky, but Bank land has been even more depressed, and I think it definitely looks much better in 24. So you're talking about acquisitions, mergers, and is that normally something that occurs in a tough time for banks rather than something in a in a, in a boom time? So that you can, you know, when you're when you're in a bind, I mean, we saw that with PacWest and and Bank of California. But you, you're in your bind, you want to stick together, right? Well, I've been equating it this way, and the operating environment needs to cooperate, but I kind of think it will. It feels to me like it could line up to be like 13. And what was happening in 2013? We'd gone through a wave of bank failures, and I'm not saying we're about to face that level of wave of bank failures, but things started to calm. We were not in a great period, but we were in this slow growth period. And you thought, we've got revenue headwinds, let's combine, let's cut cost, we'll be a stronger team together than operating independently. Bank valuations were lower than two. And what was happening is you were seeing a lot of low premium deals, quasi MOEs, like the one you just referenced, with outside capital supporting it. And the, the pro forma company was riding the wave up. You were seeing stocks pop on those deals because there was strong earnings accretion. And I feel like there's potential for that to happen definitely in 24. Got it. John, moving back to, to loan land, if the, the next time in 2024, you know, we have a conversation and I ask you about loan liquidity and you say, Jack, things have improved drastic, you know, dramatically and, and loans are just flying off the shelves. In what circumstance would that occur? I imagine one would be the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates, but what yes. what other reason would there be for the the, the whole loan trading business to to you know, step up in terms of activity? It'd be one of two things. It'd be a rate cut. Uh, a fairly significant one, we could get back to selling loans at premiums, which would immediately go to you know earnings and, and capital, which would obviously be a windfall. Or you know we've had a credit issue, and uh, credit is broken, and strategic sellers are now turning into forced sellers. 
or we're having more strategic sellers step into the into the role. But presently, we don't really see at all any forced sellers of loans at the moment. We only see the strategic side. But to, it'd be one of those two things. You know, we also it, it's one thing to say. Also, the first quarter of the year, we often see a number of institutions go through a little bit of a purchasing spree. They've got a new fresh budget for the new calendar year. So they, they, we do see increased activity in the first quarter, just as people are putting money to work, they get the full year's worth of interest. You know, they apply Cecil to that. They have the interest income to kind of offset against it. So a little bit of a trick question that Q1 is, is usually a, a bit of a bump in trading, but it, I think what you were trying to allude to is, you know, why might there be more activity? A rate cut would certainly do it and a credit issue would certainly do it. Nate, where, so if interest rates right now, 5.3% for the, the overnight rate, where in aggregate is the U.S. deposit cost? And I'm, I'm sure there are many different ways to measure that. So you can, you can tell us. And then where do you think the sort of term, if, if the terminal Fed funds rate is, is where we are right now, 5.3%, where would be the terminal deposit rate? In other words, you know, it's going to, oh, it's going to peak at 2.6%. And, you know, obviously it's possible to know, but how would you model about that? Or how would someone who was modeling that think about that? Sure. Well, what we do is, you know, we look at where the, the rate is on interest bearing deposits, and then we have a separate assumption for non-interest bearing composition. So effectively, what percentage of deposits is going to be non-interest bearing and then have an overall deposit growth projection. And the long and short of it is that we think that non-interest bearing balances are going to continue to decline. They already have quite a bit. And so the growth is going to come through interest bearing balances. We basically have outflows pretty much subsiding in the second half of the year, a little bit more trickling out, not much though in, in that way. Where we were in Q2, we were at 2.35% on interest bearing deposits in aggregate for the industry in aggregate. You know, we've got that going to 2.66, Q3, all the way up to 2.94, and then topping out in Q1 at just over 3, 3.05%. So kind of holding steady, kind of high twos by by year end, which is a, a pretty nice return. One of the things that I've been saying of why I don't think outflows will continue is think about any conversation you maybe have or heard a wealth manager talk about. I can give you a five to 6% return with minimal risk, maybe seven. What about three FDIC insured? Sounds pretty good, particularly if I've got maybe a bank out there at four or five with a CD. So I, I think banks are going to look competitive out there over the next year particularly if rates are, are stabilizing. That's one of the reasons why we believe that betas are right at their peak, hold here for a little bit, and then kind of taper off. So so you think that for interest-bearing deposits, there's going to be a really a decline in in, in in outflows that may even stabilize towards some stuff. I mean, I, I think for Schwab, for September, October, you saw you saw some inflows, but, but it sounds like on non-interest-bearing deposits, you're much less sanguine. That's right. And in and, and 24, we're expecting modest deposit growth, modest deposit growth, and pretty much all that's going to come in the form of interest-bearing deposits. I mentioned earlier that non-interest-bearing deposits have declined 26% since year-end 21. That's across the banking industry, and that's through Q2. We've seen continued declines in those balances from the early reporters. Interest-bearing deposits are up 2% during that time period. So we talk lots about how it flows, and they have occurred, and it's very real, but it's only been in that so-called free money. And so would you say businesses that have inherently a lot of non-interest bearing deposits would, would have an advantage right now? Yeah, but I mean, a lot of those are operating accounts. I'm glad you asked that. They, you're not, that's not going to go away. You know, that, that's your payroll account. You bank, and some of the banks with the lowest betas this time were the lowest betas last time or time before, because one of the things they do really well is they only bank small businesses and they have their operating account. CBVF is one I always like to, to throw out because they not only have lots of different products for their customers, but they even do fraud protection and cybersecurity protection for their small businesses. And so they're really outsourcing their accounting, they're outsourcing their payroll, but they're even outsourcing cybersecurity in that case. And their beta has been, I think, 5% through, through the second quarter, and that's cumulative. It's basically nothing. It's great. You know, every, everybody would kill for that. So if you have true operating accounts, you're not going to feel that level of pressure. What happened was in a world with no yield, those operating accounts were holding four or five X what they have historically. It was just cash. And that cash is run away. 
I think what you're seeing now is less so the commercial customers. They've had, yes, they're jockeying with, with CDs and, and when they roll over, they're asking for higher rates, but you're seeing the retail customers start to catch up too. And the other thing I've been saying to folks is think about it. For the last 15 years, you almost didn't earn anything in a bank account. So you have a large slice of the adult population who's never earned a thing in their bank account. They're awake to it now. That, that I always keep saying the cat's out of the bag. That's kind of why. I think that they're a portion that we've not really dealt with who never thought, you know, I can get a return in my bank account. And they're getting it now. Based on that deposit outlook that you, you just shared, deposits to grow mildly, how might that change the funding composition of banks who either you know, borrowing from the Federal Home Loan Bank and other borrowing, mm -hmm. which is typically you know, a, a beta of 100% or you know, close to it, that, that you know, exploded higher in Q1 and Q2 of, of this year as you had banking stress, but it's, it's gone down. I mean, could banks make money by taking, you know, closing their, their borrowing from the Federal Home Loan Bank at 5.3% and then replacing it with deposits that yield two or three? Sure. And, and we've got modest growth in borrowings for the second half of the year and then pretty much flat next year. So we're saying they're not going to be as reliant on it, but they're still going to have some of those lower yielding assets on their books. So that doesn't mean that margins completely at a bottom tomorrow or even in Q4. We probably have it early next year or in the middle of next year. And you've had a number of bank management teams come out and kind of walk back guidance and throw it out more to that level. And what's interesting is the biggest guys have all raised guidance because they were at such bottom fours and they're earning two handle margins where you have more of the smaller guys at three and a half mm -hmm. and we're kind of, as John said, I think hoping higher for longer, maybe it wasn't here and it's here, it's here. And so now they're starting to walk back some of those assumptions. Nate, what do you, what do you think the banking system looks like if higher for longer is for five years? If, you know, interest rates mm -hmm. are at 5.3% and we had a former you know, F Federal Reserve member, Bill Dudley in, in Bloomberg, I believe today saying quantitative tightening could continue to 2025, which is an upward pressure on long-term rates. So short-term rate at 5.3, 30-year at six. What does that mean for banks? John? That's tougher. <laughs> That's tougher for sure. I just am not in that camp. You know, I think, look, I think the Fed is firmly focused on killing inflation. First and foremost, I do, but I don't think they're going to have to go that far. I, I, I've said several times, thank God they don't make me pre predict interest rates, but here I'm kind of doing it. I just don't think they're going to have to go that far. I mean, I, I am in the camp with everybody else that things have held up better in the face of higher rates than maybe we thought for longer. But I also think that as we get further out, as we talked about things like commercial real estate and extend and pretend and things like that, if it stays here forever, there's more pain on the other side. And that means slower growth. That means less inflation. And I think that gets us to a place where the Fed doesn't stay at five and a half for five years. So I think it would have more of a negative impact. You'd see funding costs continue to grind higher, but I think there also is a world where they pivot on the other side of that. John, I've got a question, which is how often is it when folks call your team, they want to buy something and then you have to find a seller versus <laughs> so they call you, they want to sell something and then you have to find a buyer. And does that ratio change over time? And what might it indicate about the, you know, the, the market? Yeah, it's a seller's market or it's a buyer's market. A good example of that would be, you know, 2021 when we had all that cash and all the deposit. There were very, very few sellers and a, and a ton of buyers uh, and, and premiums skyrocket and money gets put to work. Uh, today, the opposite is true. Uh, there are very, very few buyers and, and there are a plethora of sellers. So uh, to me, that's a, it's obviously a, a leading indicator as to the liquidity situation that the, the banking sector finds itself into. And this is probably the fastest I've ever seen it go from, you know, a, a, a complete seller's market and during the during the pandemic to a one of the strongest buyers market I've seen in, in forever. If you've got cash and you can put it to work and you can buy it seventy percent yields, you know, you wish you had more cash. And a lot of those people who bought, you know, two years ago were buying all they could at two and three percent. And that's I don't know part of the conversation that we've had around this entire podcast. But uh, yeah, it's certainly uh, a challenge for folks. Well and you have to go back, John, I mean, how much does that play into the outflows we saw, right? You have for to sure. go back I think like the 30s to get an 18 month period of outflows from the system. That's not exactly built into the way we operate. So, yeah, and it was amazing to feel that on the phone, Nate. You and I have talked about this a lot, and and how we went from March where we were going gangbusters to July and August of 22, and the phone just went cold. It was really remarkable to to kind of experience just all hands on deck to get everything you could get done in Q1 and Q2, and then almost a complete reversal in the, in the second half of the year.
And, and on the flip side, it, the guys on the other end on the broker deposit desk, their phone started. Oh, fired, fired up. Uh, fired we, up. we joke about that all the time. We have our trading calls and each desk head is on the trading call. And that poor retail guy, you know, he's been getting his head kicked in for forever. And now all of a sudden he's, he's the, you know, he's the hottest guy on the, on the desk. So everybody was kind of giving him high five and saying, Hey, congratulations. You're, you're nobody needed deposits for, for years. And now all of a sudden your phone doesn't stop ringing. John, ex explain the broker deposit market. I've, I've encountered that phrase a lot. Is that the same as, as the CDs and is it just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what some people call hot money, but you know, going out there and, and, Putting a rate out, that number is probably somewhere around five and a half today. I haven't stared at that sheet. I've been on the road quite a bit here of late and, you know, being able to kind of go out and lock that liability in and, you know, be able to put that money to work. And then the opposite side is, okay, now I've got a five and a half percent liability. What kind of asset can I offset that with? And that that becomes the more difficult part of the trade. Uh, and, and back to the comment on not having enough loans to kind of meet whatever that need is. But yeah, that, that's certainly been, and Nate's uh, alluded to some of those numbers here recently, but those have certainly grown, wholesale funding, for sure. Hmm. Interesting. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much for, for joining us. It's been a great conversation. John, people can find your work, Let's Talk Loans, on your LinkedIn. We'll, we'll include uh, a description. And Nate, thanks so much. Where, where can people find your work? Subscribers to SB Global Market Intelligence beyond our paywall, but beyond that, you can follow me on Twitter at, at streettalk.pod, dot, dot pod, street talk pod, excuse me. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well on, on, under my name, and, and the street talk it relates to a podcast that I host that, that John has been on as well. So uh, check it out if you want to dive into the world of banking. Definitely. Uh, thanks so much, gentlemen, and thanks everyone for watching.